you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've been making our way, this is what we do at Calvary Chapel, we just teach verse by verse. And so we've been making our way through 1st and what will be 2 Thessalonians. And uh, we are almost to the end of 1st Thessalonians now. We are at the end of uh, the book. We're in the last chapter, chapter 5. We finished chapter 4 and then we paused last week, if you were with us, to dig a little bit more into end time things. And uh, it, because end time things, eschatology is like the theological word for that, is something that Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant of. He said in chapter 4, verse 13, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning these things. He wants us to know. Whether it's 52 AD in the church in Thessalonica, or whether it's 2021 and the church in Ellensburg, he doesn't want us to be indifferent. He doesn't want us to be unaware about future things because, and you know this to be true in, in every sense, how we view what's coming affects how, what we do right now. How we affect, view the future affects how we live. Now, I mentioned, I, there's like, like some cleanup from last week, maybe I have to do. I mentioned uh, last week, based on some feedback, I feel like I should say it again. No one knows exactly how the end times is going to play out to a T, okay? If you see that on TV or someone's telling you they know exactly all of that, no one knows. There's, there's good folks that love Jesus on, on all sides of the spectrum of the stuff we were talking about last week, and, and it doesn't have to be an area of division. It's a great area for us to be Bereans. Some of you are familiar with that term. It, when Paul planted this church actually in Thessalonica, he was only there for three weeks, but then he went on to the city called Berea. And, and when he got there, it says in Acts 17, 11, he said the Bereans were of much more noble character than the Thessalonians actually, because they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were true. And so they received the message, and then they studied the Bible. That's a good practice for all of us to be in. And so uh, when it comes to these end time things, just receive, study for yourself, man, dig into God's word. I, I do like, I came across this this past week too, something Charles Swindoll said. He said, when it comes to future things, we need to proceed as if through an intersection with flashing yellow lights. We don't want to get broadsided by crazy drivers, nor do we want to put it in park because of fear of getting it all wrong. So no one knows exactly how things are going to play out. We need to have a little grace in this area, but we're going to keep studying, keep being Bereans, and keep teaching what we believe the Bible says. Now, what we looked at in chapter 4 verses 13 to 18, what we believe the, the Bible says is that believers, those who follow Jesus, we have absolutely every reason to hope for the future because there's hope for the living and for the dead because the Lord's going to call us all up. And so with that, I mean, we talked about some vocabulary words last week. And I'll just quickly, if you weren't here, uh, there's three terms that we covered. One is the rapture. It's this snatching away, the catching up that's talked about in chapter 4. And it's this moment that 1 Corinthians 15 describes as this moment that happens in a twinkling of an eye. Where we're changed and, and transformed. And so that's the rapture. The tribulation is a seven-year period where God pours out his righteous wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. And then the third term that we discussed was the second coming of Jesus. After the tribulation, that seven-year period, Jesus Christ returns and he establishes a, a reign of justice and peace on the earth. And so we talked about those three terms, and then we looked at biblical reasons why we believe that the rapture is going to precede the tribulation, and, uh, and, and we're just kind of continuing with that flow this morning. Because, you know, when Paul wrote this, he didn't write chapter 4, and then write that, and then, okay, now chapter 5. It was a letter. He wrote it as a letter, and those numbers that we see in the text were added later. Now, there's one more thing that I want to make clear, again, if you were here last week, that maybe didn't come across as clear as I would like. 
Believing that Christians won't go through the tribulation does not mean that we believe that Christians are going to have it easy. It doesn't mean that we believe you can, if you have enough faith, you can have your best life now. That's not what it means. Things can get really, really bad for Christians. That's what the Bible teaches. And in fact, I'm sure today, earlier in Africa, in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, that Christians lost their lives for the sake of being Christians. Things can get real, real bad. They can get a lot worse for us, okay? A lot worse for us. Extremely desperate times. But the tribulation, as described in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18, is not people treating Christians really bad. It's not even people uh, necessarily only co costing them their lives. It's God's wrath being poured, poured out in judgment. And so I wanted to clear that up. This does not mean being a, being a pre-tribber, -trib, you've maybe heard that term, does not mean that we believe that Christians have it easy. Now, that brings us to chapter 5. And again, this is kind of like a part 3 because this all just kind of flows together. Chapter 5 says, Now, or but, concerning the times and the seasons, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, Brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly or accurately that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. What we've learned from chapter 4 and chapter 5 is that Paul is addressing apparently two questions that the Thessalonians had, uh, had for him. One is what happens to believers at the end of their life. Where did our loved ones go? Are we going to see them again? Are they going to be in glory with us? And Paul addressed that in chapter 4 by teaching about the rapture and the res uh, resurrection. The second question here addressed in chapter 5 is when is judgment coming? When will the day of the Lord be and how do we prepare for it? Now, this coming judgment that we just read is referred to as the day of the Lord. And it's another word, if, again, if you're here last week, we're going to add this to our vocab list, the day of the Lord. It says in verse 3, we'll give a little description for it and we'll have one up here. But in, in, chapter, in verse 3, it says it's going to be a time of sudden destruction. Okay, that's, Paul's just really briefly saying that what it is. But it's mentioned time and time again, this day of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes it's just called the day. And there's lots of ways we could define it. But it's kind of all of this. It's, it's kind of everything that we've talked about. And they want to know the timing of this. And so it's this period of time when the Lord purges sin from the world and it culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it's like Satan has had his day, man has had his way for a while, but there's a day of the Lord coming. And again, it's talked about time and time and time again. If you studied the Old Testament, you heard that phrase, uh, the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord is coming. And there's lots of places we could turn to, but there's one passage just, just for a cross-reference that we're going to put up on the screen here, and that's found in Isaiah 13. And I choose this one out of the dozens that we could because it uses some of the same verbiage that Paul is using here. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 13. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. And they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. There will be pain as a woman in childbirth. They'll be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. Whew, that's some harsh language, right? I mean, that's... It is, right? I mean, am I the only one that's like, wow, hearts melting, all of that? And this isn't just something, I, I mentioned it's, it's time and time again in the Old Testament, but this just isn't an Old Testament subject matter. Peter says in 2 Peter 3.10, and we'll have this up there as well, he says, the day of the Lord 
This is the day we're talking about. This day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Just from these two texts, if you're familiar with those, you might wonder, I'd like to know the time of this, you know? Like, that's a pretty legit question that one might ask. If I can just know when this, the Lord is going to judge the earth, when the day of the Lord is going to happen, then I can be ready for it, okay? Here's what we need to get. What Paul is going to tell them. That's their question. What is this? So I can get ready for it. What Paul is going to point out is that the solution is not knowing when the day of the Lord is coming, but to know to whom the day of the Lord is coming. He says, I don't need to tell you the times and the seasons. That doesn't affect you. That doesn't affect your life. You don't need to know the, the dates specifically and generally and all that. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. The question is not when is the day of the Lord, but to whom is the day of the Lord going to come? And when he says the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, okay, it's not a threat. Maybe you've, you've heard that before. It's like, oh man, Christian, you better get right. He's going to come as a thief in the night. This, he's not threatening them. He's reassuring them. Oh, you're a follower of Jesus. I don't need to write you about it. You don't need to worry about that. The day of the Lord isn't coming upon you. It's coming upon those who are unprepared. In fact, it's coming on those who are not only unprepared, they're overly confident that the world is headed in a right direction, that things are getting better. You don't need to worry because it's coming on the unprepared. Verse 3, for when they say, this is an important verse for us, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Something really important happens between verse 2, 1 and 2, into verse 3. Paul is talking about a whole new group of people. The pronouns go from you and us to they and them. Now, there's a lot to unpack in this little verse. If we just like do the, the, the five questions of investigation or whatever, right? You know, the who, what, when, why, and how. They're all right here in this little verse. And so we're going to unpack this, and we're going to spend a little time there. I'm going to ask you to follow my train of thought, which might be a challenge at times. But here we go. Let's talk about the who. If the you in verses 1 and 2, he's talking about the church, the whole letters to the church. It's those who have placed their faith in Jesus. They're, they're, they're depending not on this world, but they're depending upon Jesus Christ. Then the they in verse 3 is the unsaved. It's the unrighteous. It's those who reject God. Those who say, I don't believe in God. I don't need God. I can do life without him. I can fulfill a purpose for my life and have a prosperous, purposeful life without that God stuff. So the they is the world. It's those who reject God. The next question, that's who. The next question is what? What is going to happen? Well, we've already talked about that. It's sudden destruction in a moment. It's facing the day of the Lord. That's the what. When is this going to happen? It happens, he says, when they, the ungodly, when they're saying peace and safety. And, and, and these words, you know, they're, they're, uh, he, one presents an idea of like inward and one is like outward. And it's kind of like things are more stable out there. And so I'm at more at ease in here. That's kind of when, when, when they have that attitude, that's when. The why, Here's, here I need you to, to just follow my line of thinking. Do you say, when I say peace and safety, if I see someone with a loaded weapon walk through that door right now? Would you say peace and safety if you're driving along and you hit some black ice? No. You say peace and safety when you think the danger is gone. When the threat has been neutralized, or when you at least believe that the danger and the threat are gone. Again, so follow the thinking here. For they, what is a, th a threat to them? 
to the ungodly, the unrighteous, those who are opposed and reject God. What's a threat to them? Godly things. God-like things. Christians, righteousness, purity, morality, absolute truth. And so those, to get back to what we're saying here, those who reject God are going to have their guard down because they think those threats have been dealt with. We don't need God. We can make the world better without him, and we're on our way to do just that. That's, that's when they say, when the world says peace and safety. Just We've gotten rid of those old-fashioned ideas, those radical biblical values. Isn't that, that's what they say today, right? If you have biblical values, it's, now it's radical. It's what our nation was founded on. But now it's radical to believe those things. So, man, absolute truth, all of that. That's been neutralized. Peace and safety. Okay? Continue to follow the line of thinking. If the godless are saying things in the world are looking better and looking good, if those who reject God are saying things are going in the right direction, what direction are they going? Away from the Lord, right? Does that make sense? So what do you think, as an observer, if the godless are saying things are getting better because they're going away from God, as an observer, for those who are following God, what does that look like? It looks exactly the opposite. It looks like we're in a handbasket and we're going about 20 over. I mean, it's someone needs to pull us over because the enemy is winning and no one cares about biblical values anymore. I open up the paper and I can't believe what I'm reading. Doesn't the situation leading up to the day sound a lot like today? Now, again... Bear with me, okay? Have you heard of the Great Reset? Anyone? My goal is not to be an alarmist. It's not why I do what I do. But it is to be an awareist, if that's such a thing. The Great Reset is something, there's a, it's from Time Magazine. Everybody's been talking about it. If, you're, if you look for it, it's, it's everywhere. It's something that the World Economic Forum has come up with. And the World Economic Forum is an organization that was established in 1971 by a man named Klaus Schwab. And it's a group that meets annually and it, it attempts to create a global future. And their mission statement, the World Economic Forum's mission statement is this. The World Economic Forum is an independent international organization committed to the improving of the state of the world by engaging business, politics, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. I mean, right in their mission statement, it's to shape global agendas, okay? That's why the organization exists. They're unabashedly about that. Don't take my word for it. You can look it up yourself. They meet, the World Economic Forum meets once a year, annually, every year. It was supposed to be start tomorrow, actually. It got pushed back, but tomorrow was the day they were supposed to meet. But every year they meet together. And this year, the subject that they're going to discuss is how to use COVID and the pandemic to become a better global society, a better humanist society. It's time for a great reset on humanity so that we can finally start over and do things the right way. And so this, and again, you can find all of this online yourself, and we're going to have this up here, the agenda for, if you can read it, the agenda for this coming year's meeting. It says, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that no institution or individual alone can address the economic, environmental, social, technological. And so when we say World Economic Forum, understand that's not all they talk about, okay? It's economic, environmental, social, technological challenges of our complex, interdependent world. The pandemic has accelerated systemic changes that were apparent before its inception. The fault lines that emerged in 2020 now appear as critical crossroads in 2021. The time to rebuild trust 
and to make crucial choices is fast approaching as the need to reset priorities and the urgency to reform systems grow stronger around the world. At this annual meeting, I, I know a lot of you have heard of this, but uh, governmental leaders, political leaders are invited. Uh, environmentalist Greta Thornburg uh, has been there. She skipped school for it and all that. Uh, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, Dorsey, uh, uh, Harry and Meghan, Prince Charles, heads of banking and treasury departments, uh, the head of the UN, all of these people, everybody who's an influence maker that can set direction for the entire planet gathers together. And they've realized, strike while the iron's hot. Because of COVID, now's the time that we can have the world we really want. Now's the time. And so here's the talking points. Here's sessions that are to be discussed at this next meeting. And implement a blueprint, blueprint for a better world. It's time to truly become global society. Make the world the place that we know it can be. Redesign capitalism. Have an economic system that reflects the needs of everyone. Make becoming self-sustaining and green the priority. Rethink how people work. Make sure there's an equal consumption of goods. Turn the crisis into a better world. Those are the talking points. And to me, it sounds like we're going to create a place where it's peace and safety for everyone. Then things will be rid of God. We can do this without him. And now we can relax. That's the type of scene that Paul is describing. A time when the world falsely believes getting rid of those old traditional Christian values and all of that stuff. Man, we gotta, we gotta get rid of that. And, and for Christians, it seems like things are getting worse. Paul says that's, that's the time that we're talking about. Now bear with me a little bit longer, and I appreciate your patience. It also seems to me that, at least in America, this is kind of the, 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 con the, the, dis the consensus that we're at right now. A lot of folks this week, <laughs> this week, think, oh, things are finally headed in a better direction. We got 30 executive orders in three days. Finally, you know, we could pay for abortions in other countries again things are finally going the right way. That's what a lot of people are saying. Well, most Christians are saying, man, things are took a turn for the worse. Things are looking rough. So we don't know the day or the hour. We do know the times and the seasons. And I'm not saying that the day of the Lord is happening tomorrow at noon. Don't get me wrong. I know that prophecy does not center around American politics. But this is the type of situation that Paul seems to be describing. Paul says, when those who are opposed to God, says things are going the right way now. That's when they're feeling a false sense of security. And when that moment happens, in a moment, in an instant, destruction is coming on them, not on us. We've been taken out. As the destruction comes down, we've gone up. And so Paul uses these two metaphors before we move on. He uses these two metaphors to describe how, here's the next journalistic question, how the day of the Lord will be experienced by those who reject Jesus. The day, he said, is going to come like a burglar and as an expectant mother in labor. Both these metaphors tell us that Jesus is coming suddenly. Suddenly in the middle of the night, a burglar breaks in and suddenly, the water breaks and the contractions start, right? But both teach us that Jesus is going to be coming quickly, but there's also a very big distinction to make between these two metaphors. The thief comes suddenly and unexpectedly, because that's like the problem with thieves, right? If we knew when they were coming, it'd make, Pete, your job a lot easier, right? You know when, the, when theft is coming. They don't tell you when they are. Sudden and unexpected. For the pregnant mother labor can come suddenly and quickly and but once the contractions begin labor and pain is is not only expected it's unavoidable you can't 
You can't escape it once it starts. I remember we have two bio kids watching charity, watching those contractions just get closer and closer and closer together and just knowing there's absolutely nothing I can do to escape the pain. Charity was going to squeeze my hand and yank on my shirt and tell me I'm rubbing her back all wrong. I can't get out of that pain. Every contraction hurt me. It was unavoidable. Now, there's no epidural in Paul's day. Once it starts, there's no escaping the pain of labor. It becomes more intense and more frequent. And so the day of the Lord, it's going to come as a thief, sudden and unexpected. It's going to come as a woman in labor, sudden and unavoidable. And that's what Paul says at the end of verse 3. They, not us, they shall not escape. But you, <laughs> verse 4, whew, that's an important two words, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Paul switches the contrast again, the pro pronoun switch. They are in darkness, not you. This day isn't going to overtake you because you're not in darkness anymore. You have a new residency. You are now not in darkness. You are in Christ. Jot down Colossians 1 verse 13. I'm going to have it on the screen. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness, amen, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We don't live in the darkness anymore. And so the, Lord, the day of the Lord is not going to overtake us as a thief. Judgment is coming. Wrath is coming for those who reject Jesus and choose darkness. Verse 5, he goes on. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. Okay, that's, that's who you are. Those in the dark, they're going to be taken off guard. But you, man, you're ready because you're living as sons and daughters of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 6, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, be, let us watch or, or be alert, be awake, and be sober. Paul is just further drawing out these contrasts between those who reject God and those who receive God. And so because it's not about when, that can't be the focus. It's about becoming a person of the day. Those who live in the light, he says, they, they, they should live very fundamentally different lives than those who are in the dark. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. If you belong to darkness, you're going to be involved in night activities. That's, you, you do what you are. And what do people do at night that day people don't do? First thing he says is sleep. They're spiritually and morally snoozing. In Matthew 25, it's a great cross-reference maybe to jot down here as well. Jesus told a parable about ten virgins. Five of them, he said, are wise, and five of them were foolish. The five wise ones were ready. They were waiting. The groom's coming, and when he came, even though he delayed a little, it seemed to them, they were ready and they were wise. The foolish ones, when he delayed his coming, oh, they slumbered, they fell asleep, and they were unprepared when he arrived. So, number one, night people do night things, they fall asleep. Number two, they get drunk. Night people get drunk. Now, this isn't specifically talking about alcohol although that's certainly included. It's giving in to the lust, the desires, the carnality, the things the flesh wants. It's not only being under the influence of alcohol, but it's being under the influence of the world, the pleasures of the world, the things the world has. And, and, and night people, people that live in darkness, they get drunk on the things of the world. They can't get enough. They just want more and more and more. He says, but that's, that's not you. You, you be sober. As Christians, that's not our thing. Now, you ever think how different people would act if things done in the dark suddenly became exposed? I live right across from the 301 bar. Would flocks and flocks of people come to the bar and drink until they're about to pass out if it was open from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m.? 
like they do if it was open from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. Night and day makes a big difference. If someone stumbles out of the, of the bar at quarter after one in the morning, someone might say, college kids, drive home safe. But if someone stumbles out of that same bar at one in the afternoon, right after lunch, oh man, that poor guy. Gosh, what's going on in his life that it's, you know, this time of day? No, man, it, people of the night do night things, and that's always how it's been. Verse 8, but let us, that's how they do, but us, we are of the day. We're not night people. We're not asleep. We're not drunk. This is not how we live. We're of the day, so be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We don't live soberly and ready, armed with faith, love, and hope so that we can become saved, but we live ready, armed with faith, love, and hope because we are saved. Paul says, since this is who we are, let's, let's live like it. Let's not sleepwalk through life anymore, Christian. Let's not get involved in that. Pull the blinds up. Get out of the pajamas and put the armor on. Paul's application couldn't be more clear. It's not about when. It's about what kind of person to be. And this application is so straightforward. Stop participating in activities that belong to people who aren't looking for Jesus. Don't be involved in that. This is an appeal for holiness, for living righteously. Don't get caught up in what the world is doing. Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. That's not who we are. We're not involved in any of that stuff. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we're living or have died, we shall live, we should live together with him. Two appointments are mentioned here in 9. Wrath and salvation. And every single soul is going to make one of those appointments. We're either going to make our appointment for salvation or we're going to make our appointment for wrath. We're all going to make one of these appointments. But we're never going as Christians to make both. You can't be appointed for salvation and for wrath. Because once we, we make our, our, our appointment for salvation by placing our trust in Jesus, once we do, he's taken the wrath for us. We don't get appointed for salvation and then, and then receive the wrath as well. And so this is what it comes down to, he says to the church in Thessalonica. I don't need to write you about the times and the seasons because you don't avoid God's wrath by knowing when. You avoid God's wrath by receiving him and by walking with him. That's what matters. Anyone, and, I, and there's people that come into a church always talking about the end times and I'm really interested in the dates and all of that. Wrong approach. It's, does, it's not about knowing when, it's about knowing him. That's what really matters. And so we read through these and uh, if, you, if you write in your Bible, this is fascinating to me. I like to color code it. If you know me, I like everything is like different colors here. But Paul, all through here, and we just kind of read through it, but I want to point out quickly these uh, adjectives he used to juxtaposition uh, the, the night folk and the day folk, the believers and the unsaved. And so he says, they are in the dark in verse 4. Do you see that? But we, five, in 5a, we're in the light. It's night, for them, day for us, verse 5. They're asleep, we're awake and watching, verse 6. They're drunk and involved in the things of the world, verse 7. But we're sober, verse 8a. They have this false security, verse 3. They're saying peace and safety. We have real security. We have faith, love, and hope in Jesus Christ, verse 8. They've got wrath. We have salvation, verse 9. They have destruction and sudden destruction and death, verse 3. We have eternal life, verse 10. And Paul says, it's, it's about being in this column. That's what's important. 
You're of the light, he says to these, this church. You're day people. Be awake. Be sober. Don't have your hopes in the world. Place completely your hope in Jesus Christ. And since it is, you are appointed to salvation and you're going to receive life instead of death. Therefore, verse 11, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. And the Lord intends for his church, the church means called out and it means gathered together. It means both of those things. He intends for the church, the called out and gathered together to be a mutual encouragement for one another. He said in verse 10, is that we're to live together with him. Our calling, and my calling, your calling, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, those appointed to salvation, our calling is to comfort and edify, to build one another up. We have that responsibility. I've got that responsibility to speak in your life, to comfort you, edify you, build you up. You have that responsibility in my life. And so Paul understands here to just kind of step back and see that this is the calling. He understands that living in a time when, when people are by and large rejecting God and saying, oh, things are going great now, when things seem to increasingly become more ungodly, he knows that for you and I to live the way that we're called to, it's like going to battle, so put your armor on. And he says we need to rely on one another. When that's what the world looks like, we need each other. We have to comfort and edify one another. So even if there's pressure to isolate we have to surround ourselves with those who are going to do this in our life to comfort and encourage us. Those who are going to come alongside us and comfort us and say, I know it's hard right now. I know your marriage is in a, ba- in a rough spot. I know your finances are, whatever the situation is. I know you're in a difficult season or, or just coming up to someone. How can I pray for you? Or, or God is with you. He loves you, man. I, th- I just think the Lord wants you to know that he loves you. He's appointed you for salvation. Keep trusting in, in him. We have to surround ourselves with people that say that. And we need to surround ourselves with people who are going to edify us, build us up, spur us on. To, be the, to, be, to, to live the calling that we have. To let people in our life and say, man, God's got more for you than that. You can, you can do better. Are you messing around in the darkness? Are you, are you getting drunk? Are you doing this? God's got more for you. Let's dig deeper. Let's serve more fervently. And let's invest in the things of eternity. Ever increasingly, as our world is headed away from God, that has to be our approach, guys. We have to have have one another in our lives to comfort and edify. We need each other and to lock arms with one another. And so what Paul is saying is Jesus is coming. And what you need to do is start living like it. That's what you need to do. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is coming. That's a fact. We don't know the hour. But if you're here this morning and you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus, or or maybe you want to make a recommitment to Jesus, or or you know, man, I've been living in the dark. Man, make that appointment today. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't trust the world. Don't get caught up in everything the world has anymore. I'd love, if you, if you want to make a commitment or a recommitment to Jesus, man, just, I'd love to connect with you after the service or one of the other elders, uh, someone on the worship team, whatever, just, man, let us pray for you. If you do that, man, I'd really appreciate that. Now, would you pray with me?